fiestas allá afuera, pero eh, según esto se tienen que quedar allá afuera el café y las galletas. Welcome everybody. It's my pleasure uh, to to introduce Francis Helligan, who uh, whom I did my PhD in in, in Brussels. Uh, he's a re research professor professor at the Free University of Brussels at the Dutch speaking uh, university, and um, he's also the director of, of the Global Brain Institute. Uh, he has uh, one of the pioneers in uh, in exploring new technologies. For example, he, he had the first website in Belgium uh, back in the day, in, in the early 90s. And uh, also he, he uh, participated in uh, the Principia, uh, Principia Cybernetica project, which uh, has a, a very long tradition of uh, the divulgation. And let's say, uh, still it's a very useful resource and uh, he will uh, he, he's here to, to tell us about his perspective on, on the future of technology and its impact on, on uh, humanity. Uh, thank you, Carlos. Uh, so, the title of my talk, Return to Eden, with a question mark. So I'm going to sketch a scenario for the future of humanity, a scenario that's very positive, but at the same time, I'm realistic enough that know that there are many dangers, that's why it's called promises and perils on the road to a global super intelligence. You know, what do I mean by a global super intelligence? First of all, we all know that in the last two decades, there has been a global network expanding across the earth. The internet has reached practically every part of the world and it's doing more and more things, connecting more and more people, connecting more and more machines, technologies, computers, robots, cameras, etc. So we have this network, but what does this network do? This network basically is doing things that we associate with intelligence, processing information, and my claim is that this network is Intelligence, which start with every year new technologies appear, artificial intelligence, algorithms, uh, smartphones, uh, robots, all of these are somehow interconnected into the internet, just making the network as a whole more intelligent. These networks also ever provide more knowledge, ever more data, ever more information, ever more things become available to the network. As a result, we use solve problems. Whenever we have a question, we type it into Google and most likely we will find the answer within seconds. And maybe the most important factor is that these networks, they boost collaboration between people all over the world to work together efficiently Uh, an operating system, an open operating system. So these networks boost collective intelligence. So if you take all that together, you see that this network is not just a network of cables and wireless links. It is something that is starting to behave like a nervous system for the planet Earth. That's to say, a system that interconnects the different parts so that they can work together intelligently coordinated way, and I call this intelligent global network, I call it the global brain. So this is a term I have invented, but so this is one of the less silly pictures I have found of the global brain. You could see that here the earth is sprouting a nervous system. Now, what I would like to understand is what's going to happen in the future. For the GB, the Global Brain, I work at the Global Brain Institute. So many people have noticed this idea that technology is advancing, technology is producing ever more intelligent computers. So there have been several attempts to describe the ultimate effect of this explosion in intelligence. So the first idea is simply the intelligence explosion. 
That is, that once you have an intelligent technology, the more intelligent it is, the easier it will be to find solutions, the easier it will design new, better technologies. But in other words, intelligence is a self-amplifying phenomenon. Intelligence explosion, some other people have uh, formulated in terms of what is called the singularity. You see technological uh, development accelerating faster and faster, and at a certain moment, it's as if it's going to reach infinity. You come to a singular point in the sense of a mathematical singularity. And finally, a concept I have worked uh, much with in the Principia Cybernetica project, that's the concept of a meta-system transition. When you have a lot of independent systems, they become integrated to this network, and at a certain moment, you see the emergence of a new level of organization, like the transition from a single cell of organism to a multicellular organism. So these are interesting concepts to try to get an idea of what's going to happen if this intelligence explosion continues, but very abstract, they don't give you an idea of what will society be what I have been looking for in this presentation is a more concrete and more intuitive concept. In order to understand what the growth of intelligence will mean, I first have to define what is intelligence. And first I want to say what I'm not speaking about. People in artificial intelligence especially tend to equate intelligence as the ability for logical reasoning, for thinking, computing, they're all very abstract, high-level activities. I'm looking at intelligence at a lower level. I'm looking at the intelligence of animals, of plants, even of bacteria. Even bacteria have a kind of intelligence. And then I'm seeing what is this intelligence. It's not abstract reasoning using logical deductions. No, intelligence means making the right, producing the right actions in the right circumstances. You have some kind of an organism that has to survive in a complex variable environment, it needs to produce the right actions to survive in that environment. So that is, in essence, a function of intelligence. If we subdivide it in the sibrian stages, we see that there is an input stage. The organism needs to get information about the environment. So it needs to mo monitor the environment. It needs to recognize potential challenges. A challenge can be a problem, something negative, but it can also be something positive, an opportunity. Next stage, it needs to process that information it has collected, and it needs to interpret it in terms of what am I going to do about those challenges. So it should select and plan the right actions. Finally, output, it needs to perform the actions and perform them in the correct, coordinated way. And then, we, as always, in a cybernetic system, you have a feedback stage, when the action is performed, the environment changes, the organism has to monitor whether it has changed in the right way. If not, it needs to make corrections, it needs to learn from its mistakes. So now back to the level of intelligence at the global level, at the planetary level. The global brain is the nervous system of what I call the global superorganism. The, a superorganism is an organism that consists itself of organisms. Like a super system is a system of systems. This superorganism consists of all the people on this planet, all the technologies they use, which basically are extensions of their bodies and their minds, and to some degree the ecosystems that are controlled by people. I speak particularly about agriculture where we have farms just because people are controlling them. So this is the superorganism. The global brain is the nervous system of this superorganism. And that means that the intelligence of this global brain should be there to maximize the fitness of this superorganism. It should be telling this superorganism which actions to perform in which circumstances. Now we are speaking about the evolution of this global brain. And that means that generally there will be an attempt towards progress. Better developments will be selected, worse ones will eliminate it. So what do we mean by improvement of this intelligence? Well, we can look at what kind of attributes would you like a global intelligence to have. And, well, obviously, 
the more widely available, the better. Global needs really everywhere on the planet you should know. The second attribute, obviously for an intelligence, you would want it to have a lot of knowledge. You would want it to be able to answer any question. More knowledgeable, the better. I have said that intelligence is especially about performing actions, so the actions it performs should also be powerful and effective. Finally, you would like this intelligence to do so for planets and for the global superorganism, so you want them to be beneficent, to be positive, to be well intended. Uh, these are four attributes that you would like to see for any kind of an intelligent information technology. And these attributes can now be interpreted in evolutionary selective pressures. Selective pressure means if there is a selective pressure for becoming more widely available, that means whenever you have two possible ways of developing your technology, one that makes it wo more widely available, one that makes it less widely available, Typically, you will choose the one that makes it more widely available. Uh, two new technologies coming and one provides more knowledge than the other, you will choose the one that provides more knowledge. So the selective pressure means that there is, it is as if there is a pressure to get always more and more higher and higher in this attribute. The more, the better a new technology satisfies this criteria, the more likely that it will evolve. Dynamic for the evolution of this intelligence. Given the dynamic, we can try to extrapolate towards the future. Now, I will start by making a very big leap and extrapolate it to the limit. Let's assume that these four attributes would become infinite, that we would go to the infinite limit. First one everybody will have heard about is omniscient. Got this one? Omnipresence. Got this one? Supposed to be present everywhere. Act everywhere. Third one, omnipotence. God can do anything he wants. Last one, which is Perfect goodness, God is good. Perfectly moral, will not harm anybody. You want to this is God. I'm not speaking about God, I'm speaking about But the technology is getting there to some degree. Like you see, what would a child say if you explain to him what's omniscience, omnipresent and omnipotence? Well, yeah. A lot like Google, and Google is kind of a precursor of the global brain. Now, we are scientists, we are not theologians, so we need to go back with our feet down to earth, and we know that in science there are limitation principles. You cannot do everything, not everything is possible. We know, for example, that there is a theorem of Gödel which says that certain things cannot be proven. There are similar limitations in computation. Uncomputable, are undecidable. We know in physics that there is, for example, the conservation of energy, which means you can't just make something out of nothing. Principles of locality, you cannot be actually in two different places. Certainty principle, there are a whole bunch of limitation principles. Infinite capabilities are not possible. So omniscience, omnipresence, omnipotence, omnibenevolence ratify them and say they cannot be there in an absolute But what we are looking at, we want to we cannot get them absolutely, but maybe we can get them good enough, practical enough that well, we solve all our problems. And could develop equivalence of these four attributes in a more practical sense. 
So the omniscience has the ability to know. Bobo Bain knows everything. Now you cannot know everything. You cannot know at the same time. Practically, the only thing you need is to know everything that you need in order to solve the real problem. One of us, so if Global Bain would develop enough knowledge to solve all our problems, we would already be quite satisfied. And we are getting there. Technologically, there are several steps towards this omniscience attribute. For example, Wikipedia, the electronic encyclopedia, which is being read and written by millions of people on the world, starting to assemble the whole of human knowledge. Not yet there, but it's getting there. And in 20 years, probably, about every theory or fact that is worth knowing will be there. Wikipedia is meant for humans. You have to be able to read and understand like to have this knowledge available for computers, that's semantic web is an initiative for formalizing the knowledge, so that also computers could use it to make semantic web is still mostly based on knowledge introduced by humans. You would also use themselves to create knowledge, and that is what sometimes called knowledge discovery or data mining have big amounts of data, what is called big data, and these big data are getting ever bigger. If you have good algorithms, you can invent certain patterns, certain rules, certain regulations, extend the knowledge. Omniscience, ideally, that knowledge should not only be available on the web, on the computers, it should also be available inside people's heads. After all, we're speaking about a global superorganism that consists of both people and computers to be as knowledgeable as possible. There you have uh, the uh, growth of educational technologies, about MOOCs, no massive online open courses, which will very quickly and which I predict will continue to spread very quickly. So ideally, I would expect that, let's say, in two, three decades, we should be able to educate everybody on Earth with a minimum level of intelligence to the highest educational level, typically a PhD. In the Global Brain Institute, we have uh, proposed the concept of interversity, abbreviation for interactive internet university. Uh, MOOCs, uh, in order to have one kind of common repository of knowledge where everybody can contribute in order to uh, both learn the knowledge that's there, add to the knowledge that's there, improve it. We extrapolate that to the global pain. We can imagine a system that would be able to produce on the spot. You have a problem. Look up whether there's knowledge available. There is no knowledge available. Well, you use all these different technologies and you come up with a new theory that addresses what you are looking for. The omnipresence attribute can't be present everywhere in the universe, but at least we can try. Available means the global brain should sense what is happening, and it should be able, if necessary, to advise to do some action. Now, this is in a sense almost. Most people by now have smartphones wireless networks via their smartphones, they are connected to the internet. That means whenever they have a question, they can come to us. Probably will get an answer. Whenever they need to do something in a place, but they are not there, they can send, they can phone somebody there, or they can send a message to some system there to tell that this should happen. Smartphones, you still need to start it up and to look at it. Next stage are called wearable computers. 
apply the Google glasses, you wear the glasses, you don't need to switch it on or off, it's always there. The Google glasses provide what is called augmented reality. The glasses, the real world, but on top of the real world you get the information you might want. You look at a particular building and below on your glasses you see this is the cathedral of that, uh, designed by this architect in this year and it gives you more information. So we get to a stage where wherever we are, we have access to this global brain of all possible knowledge. There's a different type of uh, omnipresent, that is that the global brain should not just be present for the people that need it, it should also be present in things. And then we come to the concept of the Internet of Things. The Internet of Things is a communication protocol with which physical objects get an Internet address and can communicate via the internet protocol. Done by RFID tags or more sophisticated wireless sensors so that if you want to know, for example, where your car is parked, you send a signal and the car tells you where it is. Or if you want to know whether you still have enough fuel, the car will tell you that it needs fuel. Very useful in industrial um, processes because you can keep track of where everything is and in which place. Why these things? The intelligence. We are surrounded by devices. These devices have inbuilt processors. They can communicate wirelessly with us and with the rest of the world. And they have enough intelligence inbuilt in the sense that they can respond to our desires without us even having to ask. An example of ambient intelligence would be go to your university building at night, you don't need to do anything, come in front of the door, it recognizes you, it opens the door, wherever you go the doors open for you, the lights switch on, maybe some music begins to play, behind you the lights switch off, the doors close, you don't need to do anything, the environment responds directly to your needs. Another important um, mesh networks. These are networks that are not so much based on sensors. Lots of small sensors that communicate with each other locally, and that means that they work in practically any circumstances. You might have an explosion in a network. Mesh network, you would still have that. Then the omnipotence. Omnipotence in the absolute sense, all kind of paradoxes. You have the paradox like, can God make a stone that is so heavy that he himself cannot lift it? God would be omnipotent. He should be able to make such a stone. But if he makes such a stone, he cannot lift it and he is not omnipotent. Again, to go to a practical view of omnipotence. Whenever I need some product or some service, I be able to get it immediately at the minimal cost. Technological implementation, something that already exists now, are 3D printers. Any object builds up the object layer by layer. In order to build such an object, it needs to have a blueprint. Where does the blueprint come from? where some people or group of people or maybe artificial intelligences have designed that object. Predicted that in uh, 10 to 20 years everybody will have a 3D printer. House, computers or something. Imagine a world where whenever you need something, just search on the web for the design. The processes that are going on in the world will now be kind of remote are as efficient as possible. At the moment, we often have that one part of the earth to the other part of the earth, money and energy and provision. 
global brains type of intelligence which is shipping uh, the logistics in such a way that it is as and do that by robotic devices like for example self-driving cars uh, all these things can be done in principle in a much more efficient way you cannot only regulate uh, objects robotic devices but also people and with people i'm not speaking about controlling them but about them mobilizing them mobilizing means motivating coordinating people already happens on the web you have communities on the web like for example the wikipedia that are very well organized to produce something very complex namely an encyclopedia of all things known by you open source community today mobilization systems already exist coordinated and motivated to work very efficiently Omnibenevolence being everybody practically can't be as good to everybody because some not may not be liked by the other one. So, utilitarian principle: we strive for the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people. Technological implementation, well, first we should agree about what it is that makes people happy. We need to align our goals and values. There already exist systems for discussion and I suspect the alignment of values is not as difficult as it is. Cultures between, for example, things like the unit. countries in principle because you agree about what it is that should that learns to do the thing whenever your computer system which is connected to the global brain proposes you some solution and you are not happy with it it gets a, it gets a feedback signal that tells it don't try it again if on the other hand you are happy with it all of this and if we build in this reinforcement learning in all the systems we use methods to teach the global brain to make Another aspect of goodness is that you eliminate conflicts, conflicts and competitions, and you do that by, in a competition, you typically have a win-lose situation. One guy wins, the other one loses, what is called the sum game in economics. Ideally, you would have a positive sum game, a game where everybody and practically all interactions, it is possible to find such a synergetic win-win interaction, but it's not trivial the intelligence of the global brain you can explore many many more possibilities of interaction it's much easier to find this win-win finally that's about boosting the positive side you also make sure that you have monitoring systems that detect anything bad that may happen accidents disasters and as soon as the global brain would find that something is going on somewhere with somebody, it would mobilize the right people or the right robotic device to help that person. When I speak about omnibenevolence, it's always the most controversial part of my fear because people have this kind of cliche in their mind that they have seen in numerous Terminator and the Matrix. Artificial intelligences are intrinsically dangerous and that robots will take over the earth and enslave or, or destroy humanity. The question is, yes, but you speak about an incredibly intelligent technological system. Wouldn't it just want to take control of the planet and 
get rid of humanity altogether? Now, my answer is the global brain is not a technological system. It is the whole of humanity extended by technology. Humans and technology are both part of it. They complement each other. Not autonomous in the sense that it can make decisions independently. All the decisions made by the global brain are implicitly the decisions. are essential components of it. Artificial intelligence. Reality theories who think about a kind of an artificial intelligence much smarter than humans. It doesn't work. Just value system to make decisions in value systems are much Our value systems cannot say you should do this. Whatever rule you formulate, there will be exceptions. Real world decision making, taking into account the values, need experience. And finally, a reason why the global brain should be omnibenevolent, should only want to have the good for humanity, it's if the global brain makes humanity better off, it makes itself better off. Become, uh, more sociable, become more cooperative, then the global brain itself will become better. Will be Whatsoever, why, why the global brain would not Life difficult. Abstractly, there is an overall drive in evolution to synergy and cooperation. That's the same principle I spoke about with the zero sum game. The zero sum game is a default, but if there is a positive sum game available in some kind of configuration, sooner or later, evolution will find this positive sum game. Assuming that we have this global brain with all these fantastic attributes, very powerful, very good willing, what will be on society as we know? Well, a global brain that powerful should be able to prevent all the problems, global problems, problems like global warming, underdevelopment, war, poverty, uh, 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 illiteracy. All these problems should be solved individually as well. People who have some trouble, who are stressed, who are unhappy, who have some disease, get all the help they need from kind of an omniscient system. We should be able to solve all our problems. We will also get an abundance of resources. This omnipotence attitude is basically Much more with the energy, with the raw material. A 3D printer, for example, will just add the matter at the place where it is needed. Cut out something in the right shape with a 3D printer. Little dot of the right material in the right shape. How would we call such a society where all the major problems are solved? Paradise or heaven or utopia? The term I prefer is the term the Bible that is the Garden of Eden myths in which Adam and Eve lived or they fell from grace. But it's not typically a biblical idea. In several mythologies and religions, there is the idea of a kind of a golden age. Arcadia, a kind of land where people could live uh, very easily, very happily, without having to worry, without having to work hard. They could just play and they had everything they needed. Now, that seems maybe too good to be true. We could 
one of those exaggerations that they make in uh, mythology, but ask anthropologists who have been studying hunter-gatherers, so the primitive tribes that kind of more or less lived the way our ancestors lived uh, more than 10,000 years ago, they notice that these hunter-gatherers actually have a life that quite resembles this. These hunter-gatherers don't have to work much. They work about four to five hours a day. They do a lot of play. They amuse themselves. They have a lot of Population densities are small. They live in environments where they can get everything they need. That's in part because they don't have big just need enough material to build a hut, to make some tools and enough food, and with that, they are apparently happy. Imagine the kind of wax and enjoy and do a little work from time to time. So I call it the new Eden. It's a utopian vision, but I have shown with the global brain recreates the advantage of much more efficient technology. Devices that will do all the breaking world, but it doesn't mean that people should become lazy, challenged to do work, productive work is what makes it. and what kind of work would people do, the kind of work that people are better at than robots do, robotic devices to do all the repetitive, automatic, predictable jobs. gathering experience, gathering wisdom, experience, collaborating with others. So the picture I sketched is a very beautiful picture, but of course we need to be realistic. Is this really going to happen? What are the perils on the road to this Danic vision? Yes, dangers there are, definitely. Yes, there is a development of technology. Technology generally becomes more powerful. It becomes more intelligent. It tends to satisfy more needs, but technology we know has positive and negative effects. And the problem is that we don't always know what these effects will, will be. We can introduce a technology with the best intentions and then Negative side effects much worse than the thing. Why is it so difficult to discover and learn to manage technology? First, have bonded nationality. They cannot foresee everything. They are emotional. They tend to be biased. They tend to be blind. Often misjudge the effects of. Second thing is that. All the technologies interact with each other and with the people that use it, so you get typically non-linear, which means that, as complexity scientists should know, we can self-amplifying runaway effects. So the conclusion is, for these technologies I've been speaking about, in the longer term, in theory, they should be beneficial for humanity, but Shorter term, there are quite some dangers. So let me go over some of what I consider to be the most important dangers. First one is called in uh, complexity, complex systems theory cascading failures. And the idea is that if you have systems in a network where the one depends on the other and one of those systems breaks down and the other depends on the one that has broken down, well, then the others are likely also to break down. And like that, the breakdown propagate and spread. So, two good examples. The financial crisis a few years ago, it started with some banks going bankrupt, but that means that those banks couldn't repay their debts to other banks. 
that both these other banks also in trouble, which meant that they couldn't repay their, their debts to even other banks, which brought these banks in trouble. And if it hadn't been for a massive state intervention, the whole banking sector would have collapsed. We get similar effects with electrical networks. Sometimes a particular power plant or a particular line gets overloaded because of too much demand. That power line is then switched off in order not to let it burn through. But that means that now more electricity goes via other lines, which now also tend to get overloaded. And what you get is that the whole continent or half of a continent where all the electricity stops. Why are those things particularly dangerous now in our world? That is because propagation requires networks and requires networks where you can move easily without. That's exactly what the internet has done. It has created a global network where influences can propagate almost without resistance. That makes our networked world more dangerous for cascades. We can take some precautions. Some of the precautions chosen classic methods. If you are, uh, if you want to make your system more robust, you make sure that it's redundant. That means there are several. Suppose you have several power plants, some of which are not working. If one of them gets overloaded, you switch on the second one. If you have a problem that only affects particular types of systems. Make sure that you have different types of systems that are immune to that problem. Diversity of systems. One advantage of working in networks is that we are developing a science of networks and that science of networks allows us in part to identify those parts of the network that are most vulnerable. We could particular banks that if that bank would fail, it would create a much bigger effect than if another bank. By the most vulnerable nodes, we can try to them or to make the others less dependent on them. Finally, a generalized method, which is a bit of a primitive method, firewall, that means you something is spread, it cannot spread further than a certain period, uh, beyond which it cannot spread. Another thing that's often mentioned, but which for me is less of a problem than it may seem, that is cybercrime and cyber war. That's to say, using the network for bad things, for harming others via the internet. But that is not really new. We have spy. We have always had governments that wanted to go in conflict with other governments, use the network to try to harm other people. But to do that, they need to find some tactic or some method, let's say some work or some kind of bias, in order to infiltrate the network of the other person. But that is covered somewhere. The other party will develop a new defense. Defense will then find they will find a new way of attacking it. Again, a new protection arms race. Basically, the kind of attack hackers basically no catastrophe have happened. Start with we're speaking here about the internet, which is a network of directly kill or hurt people. You could imagine that if the internet would be used for a major war that it might destroy essential systems. Suppose that one country via the internet would create a bug that stops the electricity networks in another. In that there is a real war going on between these countries. But major developed nations have not been in war already since practically the Second World War. War is limited to developed regions like Syria, for example. There is a good reason for that. That is that major nations cannot afford to damage each other. Suppose that China would create a cyber attack to the US, and the US economy would collapse as a result. 
example, then the US would no longer be, bu be buying things from China and the, chi and the Chinese economy would also collapse. That's no good reason to wage cyber wars. They will do a little bit of espionage, but nothing that would really endanger the world. That's a different type of problem. One problem that also existed before the internet, but the problem that I think is going to get worse with the internet rather than get better. Psychological parasites. We all know that there are certain things, certain stimuli that are so pleasurable. Well, sometimes more and more can be harmful. Classical example is a drug addiction. You take heroin, it makes you feel good. sex, drunk food, gambling. Oh, recently we see something. Cyber addiction, which is an addiction to various types of electronic devices and particularly devices connected to the internet. Computer games is a classical example. People uh, in which a couple of Koreans were playing so long a computer game that they forgot about their baby and their baby died. There have been other cases where Chinese students forgot to eat and they died playing a game. So they're not really so innocent as they look. Social media like Facebook, smartphones, these addictions may be less spectacular at first sight, but I think they create a lot of stress and they make people waste a lot of their energy that they would want to Why is this becoming more dangerous? Because interfaces of our smartphones, of our websites become better, more attractive, more interesting. Therefore, we are more inclined to use them more and more. So addiction danger increases. For detail about how these can become addictive, I see three are particularly powerful to make people want to do the same thing again and again. O is a kind of state in which you get if you are in an activity that is so pleasurable that you want to continue it again and again. It's typically an activity where you need to get uh, get ever higher goals and you get constant O is typically what you get in are difficult to get out of. Stronger than what you would expect in nature. And that is because our brain does not so much absolute strength of a stimulus, relative strength. Whenever you see different things, you will tend to pay attention to the one that is strongest and is most intense. So if there are different noises, you tend to pay attention to the loudest noise. If there are different lights, you tend to pay attention to the Strongest light. Exploited by all kinds of media, for example, in publicity. Junk food contains abnormally high amounts of sugar, fat, and salt. Because of that, it's more attractive, but it's also less healthy. Movies tend to have ever more extreme special effects and violence. That makes them more interesting, but because of that, we want more and more. And the final mechanism is what I call mind viruses. That a meme is an idea that is being transmitted from person to person. Some of these memes are kind of self-reinforcing. They will convince people of all kind of irrational ideas, superstition, fundamentalist ideologies. Also, these things can spread very easily via the internet. Next problem. Loss of human abilities. That's intrinsic to the idea of technological progress. Technology is meant to make life easier. That means when life becomes easier, we need to put in less effort, less mental effort or less physical effort. But then you get the principle that's known as use it or lose it. If you don't use your ability, after a while they will disappear. If you only take on easy challenges, your abilities will no longer be trained. 
If they are weaker, you will tend to avoid even the easy challenges and only choose even easier challenges. You will feel it is even less. They will become even weaker. There is a kind of a vicious cycle where at the end you become weak and fragile and you can't do anything. Uh, the body. Some other components of the loss of human ability. That, well, our modern lifestyle is getting farther and farther away from what our body was made for. Our body evolved in a particular environment. For example, we were walking outside in the, in the Things are disappearing. If everybody is sitting at home uh, playing a computer game, you lose it. Over you tend to replace the natural food by junk food by drugs, by maybe toxins you inhale, by, uh, evo by, uh, radi uh, by radiation, by toxins. All of these make that people at the moment are not so healthy as they should be. Particularly in things like the obesity epidemic. Uh, I have recently spoken, spoken with one sociology specialist in Asia. Life expectancy has already gone down because of obesity. He had predicted that uh, five years ago that it might go down. He said that according to his latest data, it has actually go, gone down, which is an extremely exceptional event. Life expectancy goes down. Normally because of medicine, life expectancy always goes up. But here we see that there is really a danger of life expectancy and health going down. Particularly vulnerable are the lower classes by which I mean the people with a low level of education are poor, they tend to have a more unhealthy lifestyle, they tend to eat less, avoid intellectual challenges. For them, the danger is even greater. General degradation of our health. And what solution do I see? I spoke already about mobilization systems, ICT systems that encourage, coordinate people to take actions that are beneficial. In this case, there are already a number, for example, there are apps on your smartphone that exercise or healthy food. Eventually, should be able to deal uh, with that. A lost peril on the road to even. 1970, and he called it future shock. A future shock is the idea that if, stress, if uh, changes become too quickly, people get in a state of shock. That means they get disoriented, anxious. What to expect, or what to do, or what to do. Accelerating development obviously creates more. You try to go back to how it used to be in the good old days. Bad things would by now have been eliminated. Modern uh, Western uh, society there was replaced. It happened at the world level, it would create. What could we do again? Things need to change in order to get back. Everything needs to change. I would recommend that the most important change level of education and that you don't want to slow down. But on the other hand, there are lots of changes that are change their interface, functions are, 
Suppose it be a better product, tiny aesthetic change. Wonder, wouldn't they better have kept the old interface and minimized the changes? So that's a kind of a general strategy. Don't change things if they don't have to change. And give people the opportunity to stay in an older mode that they can maintain enclaves of the past, places where people could still behave the way they used to. ICT terms, I would say, if you develop a new version, make it backwards compatible so that people who use the old version from 10 years ago can still get most of your functions. So that concludes my talk. What is my message? First, Accelerating technological development. The acceleration of technological development basically is at the level of distributed intelligence. The intelligence of the global network is getting larger and larger. It can solve any more problems. It can solve ever more challenges. It can do ever more things. And the result is global brain, a brain for the global superorganism. All of us together with our technological Global brain, if you want to get a more what can it do? Oh, everything it needs to know. Available wherever and whenever you need it. Could be able to produce any product or any service that you may need. And it would be universally well intended. It would always help, never harm. Abilities would be realized and effectively implemented in our society. All our major problems. Utopian society. However, that's the end point. The road to that Eden will be perilous, will be dangerous, and will be unpredictable. So we cannot guarantee that it even will be reached. And we can guarantee that even if we reach it, on the road to it, there will be serious problems. Aware of what these problems are, we need to be aware to possibly intervene against these problems. And ideally, we would develop some protective measures Uh, these dangers less uh, dangerous. My conclusion, I thank you for your attention. We have some time for questions.
Yes, this is a very important point, and um, I would recommend a very good book about that, um, uh, which is called The Better Angels of Our Nature, uh, A History of Violence by Steven Pinker. And what Steven Pinker shows is that throughout history there has been constant conflict, violence, all the kind of horrible things uh, you describe, wars, torture, suppression. But at the same time, if we look over the last few hundred years, that violence has been diminishing and diminishing, and in the most developed regions, it has almost disappeared. And in Pinker's analysis, and he shows it with lots of statistics, Western Europe is about the place with the least level of violence for example, there hasn't been any war in Western Europe since 1945. The level of murder is about the lowest in the world. There are protections for children, for minorities, for women, and so on. You see the same in, in, in places like Canada, like the US, uh, Japan. The more developed the country there is, the less this violence is there, and the less this struggle for power plays. So I have implicitly assumed that this evolution, which has been there already for uh, centuries, will continue and will accelerate. That's the tricky part, because the evolution Pinker sketches has taken, let's say, at least since the age of enlightenment, 18th century, to come to fruition, at least in regions like Western Europe, to, s to a less degree in the US, where there is still much more violence than in Western Europe. But the global brain, for me, would accelerate that to several factors. First, there is a general education. If you educate people, they see more opportunities to develop themselves. They no longer feel like they have to fight and take something from somebody else. Reduction of poverty. If everybody is more or less rich, there is less motivation to steal things or to get rich at the cost of others. There is the goat of empathy, if you get a better view of what other people are thinking, what other people are feeling, you will no longer consider them as dangerous, as enemies. Rather, feel empathetic with them and not want to harm them, not want to, to, to dominate them. So there are a whole, read, a, a whole set of these trends which Pinker analyzed, which the global brain will all facilitate and accelerate. So in that sense, I mean, I spoke a little, about, uh, uh, a little bit about it when I spoke about cyber war. Why is cyber war unlikely? Because basically, war between developed countries has disappeared. I have understood that it's that. Some countries may still want to dominate. They know they can't really dominate. They are dependent on the others, and this interdependency becomes greater and greater. The whole network makes everybody more interdependent. And the more you depend on others, the less you can afford to try to dominate and to suppress them. But I agree with you that that force of domineering, of power, of conflict is still strong. And yeah, it will be one of the problems on the roads to, to this issue.